after this, about a month later, after we did this uh, uh, this uh, trip to Cairo and back, he was the guy who was flying the Cessna 210 when he had an engine failure, when all the oil disappeared. <laughs> And I had to go and rescue him again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that, that was interesting because he I, I flew in from Port Sudan early that morning with a 404 to Khartoum. Uh, and Mark left to go to Damazine, uh, which is down the end of the Blue Nile on the Ethiopian border, to collect some people and, and, and bring them back uh, to Khartoum. And I was in my apartment when the Belgian pilot came up and said, hey, Dave, I've just been in the office downstairs and Mark never got to Damazine, you see, he never arrived there. So I went down with Michelle to see the boss and say, look, well, you know, he should have been there five hours ago. Maybe he's had a crash, you know, maybe he needs help. We've got to go and look for him. So the boss kind of, okay, so we took a Cessna 404, myself and Michelle, the Belgian guy, and our old uh, mechanic from Thailand, old Patch, uh, his name was Patch, he used to work for Air America in the old days in Cambodia and Laos and stuff, you know, during the Vietnam War. So the three of us went with some tools and so on. And we had like 11 hours fuel in the 404. We took off and we flew down the route to Danzig. And about an hour after we left Khartoum, lo and behold, we saw the Cessna 210 parked on a dirt track beside the railway line in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we flew overhead and there was two Land Rovers there. And then we saw Mark came out and he was waving at us and, and uh, so on like that. So he went to the aeroplane and got on the radio and I, I, I called him from the floor and I said, what happened? And he said, lost all the oil out of the engine and I was, had to make this false landing on this little dirt track, you see. So I said to Mark, okay, well, I'm gonna see if I can land there. But what, what you have to do is you have to get in the Land Rover and in front of where you've landed and drive along that track. On, on one side was big power lines and, and an elevated railway line. And it was just a Land Rover track. So I said, you drive along that track in the Land Rover at 50 miles an hour for like a kilometer. And if your teeth are still in your head, I'll try and land there. So I saw them race along in the Land Rover. They came back to the aeroplane. He called me and he said, yeah, I think it's all right, but it's very narrow. You know, there's big ditches on each side, but I think you'll be all right. So we went round overhead the power lines and everything and then landed over the top of the, the 210 on this dirt track. And, and about one meter each side of the main gear, there's like two meter ditches down and, you know, because of the... And the problem was the soil is black cotton. Unfortunately, it's dry, but the rainy season was coming. So we found the 210, the, the oil drain plug had come out and disappeared. And we didn't have a spare, so we couldn't top up the oil or do anything. But to protect it, we got some big railway wooden sleepers and we got some uh, Sudanese to help us. And we put it on the railway sleepers so that when the rains came, it wouldn't just sink in the mud, you see. And then the, the company would have to come and retrieve it. And we could have flown it out of there, you know, it would have been impossible. It would be possible to fly it out of there. Um, and then with Mark and, and uh, we picked up Mark and um, did the old uh, uh, takeoff where you lift off on the uh, 95 knots with the stall water going below single engine control speed because the, the road is very rough and accelerate and gear up and everything and, and get single engine control speed and then climb, you see. And uh, so then we went to Damazine and picked his passengers up um, and flew back to Khartoum. So everything turned out all right. But they never went to recover the aeroplane. And after about two months, the rainy season was on and everything. And um, they went to collect it with a truck. And they took the wings off the aeroplane and put it in the back of a lorry with the wings moving, but they didn't tie anything down. And so they then drove this truck all down these really rough roads and everything all the way back to Khartoum. And when it came back, it was a complete write-off. There wasn't an undented part of the aircraft anywhere. <laughs> it was just smashed to bits from sliding around, banging around at the back of this lorry. 
And also because there was spare space, I'm sure they just piled loads of stuff on top of it. <laughs> that was the end of the 210. It was finished, gone forever. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. He left, he, he left fairly soon after that and went, went back to England and he ended up flying for British Midland Airways and East Midland and the Belgian guy ended up working for Air France. <laughs> I think he was still there. Uh, they, 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 they had their own air wing, but they, they had a bunch of twin otters and, and then a Convair 580. But the, the Convair was too big to do a single person medevac and they needed it there anyway because of the oil field in the south and the twin otters didn't really have the, the range, I think, was probably the problem with a twin otter. Um, and they had a bunch of old uh, DC-3s, which was contracted from, from uh, an American company. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did an interesting, interesting flight down there. I went with the Baron uh, uh, down to Robcona with some VIPs or something who were visiting the Chevron site. And and they used to live in a, a big barge, you know, a luxury barge on the river. Yeah. With air conditioning and all the mod cons, you know, all the food was imported from the United States and so on. Um, yeah, and the rebels eventually attacked that uh, barge and, and it, everything stopped down there. But before that, I, I went down there with these people in the Baron, and uh, then they were going to fly up the oil field in a Belgian Ranger helicopter. So they said, "You want to come along?" So it, it got talked to the, the the pilot of this this helicopter pilot who was the next Vietnam veteran. He'd flown in the Vietnam War helicopters, yeah. um, and we got in this jet Ranger, and the, the passengers sat in the back. I sat up the front with the pilot. And he start, started up this jet range. And as soon as the rotors started going around, the vibration started up. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then it was up to speed. And you couldn't even see the instrument panel. The vibration was so bad. It was vibrating like hell. And, and I'd never been in a helicopter before. I thought, blimey, you know, this is not a good thing to do, you know, surely. But maybe it's normal. So I asked the guy and he said, oh, hell no. The, the rotors are a bit out of balance, but we'll get it sorted out later. And we took off in this in this thing to fly up the oil field. And it's all like flat grassland, quite high grassland. And the, the collective with the throttle on it, you know, is he, he would pull up the collective yeah. and then it's got a, a throttle friction and he'd let go and just fly with one hand. And we, we were flying at like 100 feet above the grass and slowly the helicopter would descend until eventually we just touched the top of the grass and then he'd grab hold of this handle and wind on it again and we'd pop up like this and then slowly descend. And I said, what, what's up? He said, oh, the throttle friction's broken. And he said, I can't be bothered to hold on to it all the time. So eventually the vibration, it just unwinds and the <laughs> helicopter just sink towards the ground. And uh, we went up to this place and, and uh, we had breakfast there. They had all these containers with air conditioning and yeah, you, know, you had the old American pancakes and maple syrup for breakfast and all this sort of stuff. And then there's a helicopter pilot said, would I like to go out and have a look at something he'd seen interesting? So we took off again and just hit him and I in the helicopter and flew off some miles away from where they were drilling and so on. And um, we came across this, this herd of about 20 elephants that had been shot. And there were all these, these uh, you know, obviously poaching. So he showed me around this and, and so on. And uh, we couldn't see any Land Rover tracks or anything. So I figured it was probably rebels or something, but it's a real shame because most of them, most of the elephants were too young to be carrying ivory. You know, there's, there's yeah, really yeah. only two, two of them that even had pus. Yeah. But they'd obviously been shot with machine guns and so on. Uh, yeah, which is really sad. Um, and then on the way back, he decided to demonstrate to me what a helicopter could do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really funny if you're only used to flying fixed wing because when the airspeed indicator kind of goes to zero you think it's going to fall out the sky but you just go into a hover but then we were quite close to the ground and you would tilt it up so we were almost facing the ground like this and then turn it around and the next minute you were looking straight up at the sky <laughs> and, 
going all round like that until you didn't know whether you were upside down or the right way up. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but that was my first experience of a helicopter flight. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna